Wow, folks, that was great. I really appreciated Margie's presentation. I'm so excited about um, what these next few days are going to be about. But I know there was some really interesting chats going on. I know I was chatting in there. Um, well, now what we're doing is our um, breakout session. Um, and this one is... This one is called Partnerships in Treatment, Higher Education Avenues for Curriculum and Services. And um, just so you know who I am, who, who I am talking to you here, I'm Carrie Wyrick. I'm with uh, NetCare. Um, we run crisis residential uh, home and a crisis stabilization unit. Um, and I'm on the board of the Crisis Residential Association. And I'm super excited to be here. Reminder uh, to be as interactive as you can be on the chat. Uh, it's super uh, fun to um, comment or ask questions in the Q&A, and we'll try to get to those and get you answers to those as, as soon as we can. There will be a link to the session survey towards the end of the session. Um, we also remind you to look at the scavenger hunt and um, visit the exhibitors. The scavenger hunt, remember, um, you can enter that by just uh, clicking into our breakout sessions and visiting in exhibitors. So that's super, um, super fun. And I, I looked at the exhibitors and some of them have fantastic um, publications that are really uh, beautiful and, and fun to look at. So I would like to introduce our presenters for uh, today's uh, first breakout session. First of all, Dan Machia, he is a PsyD. He's a, a California licensed clinical psychologist and he's vice president of residential services at Community Research Foundation in San Diego. In this role, he oversees an integrated system of seven regionally located research vetted crisis residential programs called START, short-term acute residential treatment. Dan was introduced to the crisis residential model and the CRF START programs as a practicum student while completing his doctorate degree. He quickly recognized the impact these programs had on individuals experiencing a behavioral health crisis. He accepted a direct service position following his practicum, then quickly worked his way into crisis residential management. Today, Dan has 20 years of experience working in crisis residential services and has dedicated his career to this important level of care. He's presented both locally, statewide, and nationally on the START program model. Rania Hassan has 10 years of behavioral health experience and leads efforts of bringing collaborative administrations to the table to holistically think tank in order to aid the advancement of mental health care. Rania is a licensed clinical professional counselor and a national board certified counselor. She has experience supervising crisis residential centers and adult child mobile crisis response teams. Currently, Rania is assistant dean for the office of the Dean of Students at the University of Illinois at, Urbane Chir at Urbana-Champaign. Her focus is behavioral intervention with emphasis on threat assessment. Through partnering with hospitals, law enforcement, jurisdictions, schools, and other community providers, she works to create meaningful impact that will help reduce instances of crisis and recidivism. Rania specializes in building teams that are equipped with clinical knowledge, environmental support, and evidence-based approaches with intentional focus on multiculturalism to meet the needs of communities. So Dan and Makia, Dan, Makia, Rania, Hassan, Dan and Rania, please take it away. Hello everyone. My name is Rania Hassan. And today I will be presenting with Dr. Dan Masia on partnerships and treatment, higher education avenues for curriculum and services. Our objectives will be to provide you with some insights on how you can build a relationship with local universities and community colleges who are in need of crisis residential services, learn more about the structures of higher education systems, 
and understand a little more about higher education suicide and threat assessment processes. Dan today will provide valuable information on the role students play in the crisis residential model. And by the end of the presentation, you will have a better idea of how to manage student practicum and internship needs. I want to take a little bit of time and share how my crisis background has uniquely fit into a higher education school population setting. In addition, I want to help educate everyone today about the growing needs of our crisis services by the student population. While completing both my bachelor's and master's degrees, I held positions in residence life programs. It was clear back then that my mental health specialization mental health programming, and even started Roosevelt University's first brief alcohol screening and intervention program for college students. This program allowed students to get help rather than receive sanctions that affected their academic standing. I enjoyed working in higher education settings and already had worked on a crisis line during this time. I noticed both my positions went hand in hand with what I was doing at work and what I was learning in class. During my years working on crisis teams, I supervised an adult crisis team, mobile crisis response, a crisis residential center, and a counselor. This crisis line was funded by the Mental Health Board and the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign is within that county. The university utilized the line a great deal. Champaign's locals now joke and call it a mid-sized town, and it has grown greatly over the last 10 years. We now have a few high-rise apartment buildings due to the growing housing needs of students. Throughout my 10 years of crisis work, I made it a priority to consistently build a relationship with the university. By doing this, the consumers of the crisis teams and students of the university benefited from collaborated resources. I often bring up the concept of coming to the table. And throughout this presentation, I hope you see the many benefits that are a result of creating a coming to the table meeting and working hard to keep it going. Through always coming to the table, I went on to create multiple crisis need contracts with the university. Before 8 a.m. and after 5 p.m., on holidays, the crisis team was back up and responded to the needs of any person, not just students, because you also have staff, employees, and their families trying to access the university counseling center, psychiatric services, or the employee assistance program. Through relationship building, the university police department felt comfortable teaming up with our crisis clinicians to assess within university settings. I will also mention that we worked with the Parkland Community College to offer similar services. All of this kept our crisis and crisis residential teams very busy. This year, I decided to join the Office of the Dean of Students at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign as an assistant dean. Each dean within this office has their own specialty area, such as off-campus living, medical withdrawals, and so forth. My specialty area is behavioral intervention. The university has multiple teams to help assess for student needs and safety. I am involved with the behavioral intervention team, threat assessment team, and students of concern. In addition, I fulfill a rotation as emergency dean and take part in the crisis intervention city team meetings. Please feel free to ask any questions during the Q&A portion, and I will have my contact information at the end of this presentation. So do not hesitate to contact me if I could ever be of any help in helping you navigate or understand higher education systems.
Dan and I sent out a survey to all Crisis Residential Association members. Thank you for everyone that completed it. From the people that responded, we found that majority are located near a university and all were located near a community college. But no one that completed the survey had a higher education institution within their top three referral sources. So definitely a population you may be missing. There was strong interest in wanting to work with an institution, but not knowing how. We identified that not much outreach or engagement with institutions has occurred in the past. Our respondents indicated having crisis line contracts with institutions, working with universities to provide presentations on COVID-19 precautions, and providing clinical hours to help with licensing. A really great idea was posed by a respondent sharing interest in wanting to partner to offer curriculum for credit, which is a great idea, as we often hear that classroom instruction alone is not enough, and internships may not cover all desired training needs. You may find some other takeaways today are going to be the experience and statistics that allow you to see that students, staff, faculty, and their families can benefit from crisis and crisis residential resources. It will be up to you to decide if you want to build this relationship connection in order to provide help to this population. At the crisis residential I supervised, when describing it to a client or prospective collaborator, I would say we served every walk of life. Someone who has experienced symptoms for the first time. Someone who has battled mental health for five decades. A person affected by a stressful event. Students, professors, a person without an address. All walks of life. If there is a population that you have not helped at your crisis residential, but know they are in need of services, especially if there is a deficit in their access, it will be your initiative to work with this and work it into your next quarterly or annual plan. So throughout my presentation, you're going to see that there's a high need by the student population in university settings. Um, I'd like to share some stats with you to help you better understand the needs of higher education institutions. Approximately 41% of 18 to 24 year olds in the United States attend a college or a university. Serious psychological distress affects an estimated 17% or more of these students. In the largest study done on students looking at factors of accessing mental health resources, more than 10% of college students in that study indicated that mental health problems substantially affected their academic success. I have included this study in the references and I recommend looking it over as it outlines barriers students experience that affect their utilization of mental health resources. Items like this can help you understand how helpful crisis residentials are to student populations because the services that we provide are available so just the route that the student needs to use or the university member is what needs to be created. So that's where we come in. I also wanna share that it's expected that a use of services among students with current mental health symptoms or recent mental health related academic impairment is expected to rise by an average of 39%. That's huge. So recent data has noted a already 30% increase in in-demand for mental health resources on college campuses. Mental health treatment utilization on college campuses remains disproportionately low among underrepresented students. And these categories for these students include racial, ethnic minorities, first-generation college students, and students from low-income families. Also, Students report that factors including stigma, long wait times, and costs are barriers to accessing treatment. This is where I really think our crisis residentials can be of great value. So now enter COVID. 
So I will say that currently there is even a greater need occurring due to COVID. And I had a little fun here. So I'm saying that BC is before COVID. So 2018 BC and then 2020 DC during COVID. So we are currently still in this pandemic. Um, so due to COVID, students may not be on campus or campus resources are not to their preference. In the fall of 2018, there was already almost 7 million students already in distance education courses. So there was a need. However, currently we're at an all time high. Institutions are attempting to adjust their campus plans with some institutions going all in person, all online, or a mixture called hybrid learning. There will be students who do not have access to mental health resources and end up in crisis. An example of lack of access with going online is if a student is not located in the same state as the university or institution counseling center. There are schools who are not able to provide services in these cases. This is another excellent example for crisis teams and how helpful crisis residentials can be at this time to step in and help. With masks, of course. We know that crisis residentials are short-term options that provide individual, groups, psychiatry, and case management services. In higher education settings, the idea is multifaceted, multi-departmental approaches that all come together to provide referrals, counseling, psychiatry, threat assessment to self and to others, stress specialists, and case management services. On the left in the photo, I am highlighting Hope House in Martinez, California. I wonder if we have anyone from Hope House here today. On the right, this is not a university affiliated center. Rather, this is a response to the need for mental health services for university students. It's located in Orlando, Florida. It's called University Behavioral Center. The name's a little confusing because um, you would think it's probably near a university and a part of a university. However, it is not. It is close to the University of Central Florida, but not affiliated. It sits on a four acre campus. It includes a swimming pool, a gymnasium, outside recreation areas, four acres of them, and it is described as a secure 24-hour supervision facility that helps promote safety and a therapeutic environment. So there are centers like this one that are popping up that are meeting the need of university students. So now I hope I have your attention that and hopefully you are probably asking, okay, how do we help the student population? And how do we help them know we exist? I have a few suggestions. First, I wanna ask a couple questions. How many of you have an annual relationship collaboration calendar that you consistently update? How many of you have a larger plan then have sub plans depending on the collaboration of interest you are working with. And my last question, who do you employ to help you build and sustain these relationships? Lots of questions, but the answers to these questions will help you greatly. Weekly, you wanna create a warm handoff process, either your mobile crisis team or crisis residential needs to work on the consistency of releases of information and forwarding treatment planning by having that weekly info sent over. So you want to establish a contact with the university. 
It could be as simple as a release of information or a discharge form. The idea is having a weekly flow. It's sort of like a, a line of communication. The institution will know that you came into contact with any student. And for crisis residential, we know that continuity of care is of utmost importance for the person we are trying to help. Monthly, you want to work with a university contact, such as the Office of the Dean of Students or the Counseling Center. You should be sharing data. It can be in the form of a table, Excel, or presentation that you update monthly. In this email or Zoom meeting currently, you can discuss changes, trends, new offerings, and vice versa. You learn about what is happening at the institution. Through this, you will sustain the relationship, but also grow it as your conversations unpack and the need to include others is introduced. Every six months, you can switch off and have a leader contact come to your team meeting and you go to theirs. You provide updates and answer questions. Trust me, your expertise is more than welcomed and so are theirs to your team. Annually, you can invite the institution to one of your organization's events and attend one of theirs. The options are endless here, whether you put on presentations, town hall meetings, and everyone knows that universities have many different platforms that have presentations, that are providing perhaps CEUs. So vice versa, you can work together to be able to do this. Usually, Every three years, you renew or propose contracts. Through all of these other meetings and with the data already collected, so these other steps, as you notice, I'm having you collect data or I'm suggesting you collect data and you're working through the data and building different trends and packing it with knowledge that you learned along the way, this data allows you to have the information you need to pitch the need. Now that's if you want to create a contract. You don't always have to have a contract to maintain the relationship and for either side of the relationship to benefit. So for us to be able to help clients and for the university to be able to have a resource for their students to assess. I want to show you an example of a more detailed calendar I have used. And you can see here, I was building relationships with more than just the Office of the Dean of Students and the Counseling Center. During orientation, departments want to orient their staff and help them understand resources available. Educators and staff, having this information makes a difference in a student utilizing the service. So if an educator, a staff member, or whoever you are working with to help them understand your crisis residential services, understands the ins and outs and can describe it, there's more of a chance that that person will utilize that service. Before the semesters start, I usually link with professors, department heads, and supervisors to create my semester schedule. It would become jam-packed. I, I eventually learned I needed to create sub-collaboration schedules where I employed the help of senior team members or team members who excelled in collaborating or presenting on a topic. This is great for team professional development and employee satisfaction, as it fulfills their work goals and desires. At the same time, it helps you as a manager, supervisor, leader, not become overwhelmed that all of this work, all of this relationship building sits only on your shoulders. I'd like to point out in this schedule that I also collaborated with cultural centers and student registered organizations. And this helped provide access to underrepresented students that we discussed earlier in this presentation. So you wanna think intentionally about who are you presenting to? Who are you reaching out to? And universities, no matter their size, have many different avenues for you to utilize and to be able to continue to grow. The idea with the collaboration and sub-collaboration schedules is to help you vary your audience, stay on top of the schedule, which will help you be consistent and sustain all the hard work you put into building the relationship. 
There's so much work that goes into building a relationship. So you want to be able to create a sustainable process that doesn't fall short at any period and requires you to restart the process. Being able to employ the help of others that you are working with so you don't drown is greatly needed in your position. Do not feel that you should take on everything alone. But also, you want to be the leader or the team member who helps others thrive. And I just want to mention this, that when you apply for grants or do presentations about your teams, items like this reflect the hard work you do without you having to do double the work in creating the presentation or in sharing what awesome things your teams are doing or how helpful you are to the clientele you are serving. You want to create tools that you don't have to recreate for presentations or for grant applications. So really try to come up with ways of not recreating the wheel for everything and being able to utilize tools that really display what you're doing and are able to be worked into different items that you need. So the last part I want to talk to you about is thinking about the referral system or process you are utilizing. You may need to have different versions of your referral for different collaborations. My suggestions are to keep it as simple as possible and gain the feedback of the collaborative. Let them know that this referral form is specific to this specific referral avenue in order to make sure that it works for both sides. It is also great customer service care and your collaborative will be impressed with your individualization. So on my area, we are going to be having a Q&A after uh, Dan presents. So make sure if there's any questions that you have, whether it be about the details of what I would include in an email PDF fill form that I created to simplify the referral process, or um, how to work with your tech department to do an online form, make sure to ask your questions at that time. At this time, I'm going to pass it off to Dr. Dan Messia to help us learn more about the internship experience. Thank you, Rania. We're gonna take a turn now to the utilization of crisis residential programs as a behavioral health training ground and how you can utilize students as part of your workforce. CRF, the company I work for in San Diego, runs the Start Crisis Residential Programs. We have a lot of other programs agency-wide, and we bring on a great deal, a great number of interns every year, students and trainees every year. Um, in 2020, we brought on 109 trainees agency-wide. 66 of those are placed in our Start Crisis Residential Program. So a huge number of people come through our programs every year to learn what we do and to learn how to be clinicians of varying types. Um, we happen to have uh, contracts with uh, 41 different programs at 31 different colleges and universities. I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Um, the students we work with and the trainees we work with have varying disciplines. Um, the disciplines are, include MSW, people working on their MSW degree or pursuing post-degree licensing hours. We work with PsyD and PhD psychology students, both pre-doc and post-doc. We have MFT trainees, pre-licensure uh, pre with the Masters of Counseling program and post-degree to uh, pursue licensing hours. Same thing with LPCC students or trainees. Um, we work with nursing students, and we have a fellowship in community psychiatry with UCSD School of Medicine. So a lot of different types of uh, multidisciplinary groups of people come to our multidisciplinary team to learn um, from our programs and the people we work with. Um, we have a lot of lo local universities here in San Diego, and that used to be something that was, we always felt was really key. You have to have, it's best to have a program like this, a crisis residential program, located in a city that has a college or a university that trains people to be clinicians. Um, with the expansion of online higher education options, we have found this to be a great um, advance in, in our pool of, of uh, re recruiting students where, um, 
people might do their placement in San Diego and still be able to pursue their degree elsewhere in another city, another state, um, while they're working at our program. So this online uh, education uh, expansion has really contributed to, uh, again, what I mentioned earlier, the number of different programs and universities that we are affiliated with at this point. Um, CRF has a mission statement, which is, you know, a couple paragraphs long, but we end with, we inspire and mentor the next generation of behavioral health and social service providers. Um, and we really live by that statement. Uh, it's unusual to find a San Diego licensed clinician or provider who did their training in San Diego, who has not experienced one of our crisis residential programs as part of their clinical training at some point. Um, and what we hear from the feedback we get from people who have come through our programs, um, a lot of people end up in private practice and other settings like that, is the level of clinical experience gained is, is huge. Um, they get a lot of exposure to a lot of different uh, client needs and, and situations and issues that come up. They get a great uh, deal of training on providing uh, other providers in the community, other resources in the community. They, great, they get a great deal of uh, comfort with higher risk clients, severe persistent mental illness, uh, people who are at risk for um, dangerous self, others, things like that. So they get a great deal of uh, confidence as a clinician having come through one of our programs. It also works as a good recruitment tool. Um, this year, we, you know, every year we try to encourage our student workers or our trainees to stay on after they've completed their hours and come work for us, you know, continue to work for our programs. Um, this year we converted 14 people from trainee or intern student to uh, paid staff members. And uh, that is great. However, those numbers used to be a lot higher. Probably more than 50% of our people would stay on after their trainee experience was done. Um, and what's led to the reduction in that recruitment is uh, a lot of school curriculum requirements have changed where either the, the demands of the schooling uh, do not allow for space to continue to work for paid positions, part-time jobs, or what mostly happens now is the, the, the internships have to go like one after the other. So they finish our intern and they have like a month off and they start another internship site. So not a lot of time to stay in, and uh, work. Uh, so, but what we do do is we encourage people, you know, after your next internship's over, come back and work for us. After you're, you know, finished with your schooling, come back and collect your licensing hours with us. Uh, come back after you're licensed and come work for us in different positions, if not for the start of the crisis residential programs, anywhere in CRF. So it's been, we always keep those, those connections going. To bring on student workers or trainees, uh, you have to have affiliation agreements, clinical affiliation agreements. So um, a clinical affiliation agreement uh, is an agreement between the university or even step further, the program at the university. So you might have an affiliate, you might have um, students that you bring in from a university, but they, there might be four different clinician clinical programs at that university that you take students from. Each one of those programs would typically need a clinical affiliation agreement. And what that does is it really outlines the responsibilities of the university, what they're gonna provide for us, what they're gonna provide for the students or the trainees that are coming into the programs. It outlines the responsibilities of the agency. We're gonna provide you know, a number of hours a week. We're gonna provide clinical supervision. We're gonna provide you know, a certain level of training. Uh, it outlines the responsibilities of the trainee, what we, what we what everybody expects of the trainee professionalism and then certain requirements that they have to meet in order to maintain good standing. It talks about the length of the terminate, the length of the term of the contract and any termination of the agreement, uh, how long this contract or this, this agreement is in place, and then how either party goes about terminating the agreement at any, at any time. It outlines insurance requirements on the university side, on the agency side or the program side, on the trainees side, depending on what the different you know, requirements are for what that person's pursuing. It also includes any legal notices your agency or your funding source or the state or the school might require. Um, challenges uh, that come up with these, uh, 
Well, we, have, we used to have a little bit more of a cohesive group of students from the local university uh, that would come through and everybody had the same requirements and everybody had the same length of time that they had to do their hours and, and the months that they worked at the programs. As we've expanded to uh, a larger pool of students uh, from different schools and different backgrounds is we have found it's, it's challenging to remember or maintain all the different contract requirements. So, um, you know, one student might need a six month contract, one student might need a 10 month contract, one student needs to work 12 hours a week, one student needs to work, you know, 30 hours a week. It just, it just depends. You have to be really be aware of what the different um, requirements are for that trainee. Um, and then one of the other things that has come up more frequently, uh, or more recently, I'm sorry, is uh, the impacts of COVID. So when we have a program that is recruiting a lot of student workers or trainees, sometimes we can have up to eight, nine, 10 trainees at a program. When COVID started coming around um, and getting more serious and things started closing down, um, of course, our programs didn't close down because we're all essential services and we're essential workers. However, the schools started pulling their students for fear of liability and making sure that everybody was safe, uh, which is understandable, but it did take large portions of our workforce away when at the same time we had the compounding variables of our own, you know, paid workers, our own, you know, employees, um, having issues with COVID and, and uh, situations where they were getting pulled in and out of work and, or put in isolation or quarantine and whatnot. So it really led to a large uh, sustained issue or sustained program. There was a period of time where they were trying online or telehealth options and telehealth clinical supervision. Um, then there was a period of time where some of the schools were having the students that they wanted to work, they could work and continue collecting their hours, but they had to sign liability waivers so they wouldn't uh, come back after the school if they did get exposed or get sick um, as a result of uh, being at the program. So um, what we have found now is I think things have settled down a little bit in that arena. Um, and this new school year, we're seeing students returning to the programs. Um, we've been communicating with all the different universities and schools that what, what precautions we have put in place to protect our workforce and our clients from COVID, um, how we manage isolation and quarantine protocols, hygiene practices, uh, all that stuff. So I think it, we're, we're, we're starting to see students returning now. Um, and I think some of them are still required to sign some liability waivers, but it's coming back together a little bit now and hopefully it will continue to do that on that, on that path. If you're bringing on trainees, typically you need, to provide you need to provide clinical supervision and clinical supervisors. So typically if somebody's in a school program, um, there has to be a clinical supervisor on staff uh, to do that clinical supervision. Sometimes it's a third party, like a clinical supervisor is specifically hired to do those things. Sometimes it might be another licensed clinician that works at the program. For instance, the program director or agency or program administrator might provide clinical supervision if they're licensed. Um, or uh, it, it, for people who are postgraduate or post degree, um, they can also hire um, uh, themselves an outside clinical supervisor. And that's where we talk about internal versus external clinical supervisors. Uh, so they would hire somebody to do supervision for them. And typically what the agency would wanna have in place is a business affiliation with that supervisor, that outside practitioner, um, that they're gonna you know, protect clients PHI and things like that while they're working with uh, the, the trainee at our program. Um, we have found that clinical supervisor disciplines vary obviously and student needs vary you know, somewhat. Um, and we found the best clinical supervisor or most you know, uh, utilized clinical supervisor discipline would be a psychologist, a licensed psychologist can uh, certainly supervise psychology students, but then also can supervise a certain number of MFT hours and LPCC hours and things like that. Sometimes we have the need to expand clinical supervisor hours. We need more people that come in through the program need supervision. Um, and what we've been, you know, instead of just clinical supervise, expanding the, the psychologist clinical supervision hours, we've been uh, looked, seeing the benefits of adding a different supervisor, for instance, an LCSW. Um, that they, they need specific LCSW supervision if they're, if they're um, 
pursuing that license or that degree. So it does help to diversify your clinical supervisor disciplines a little bit, and we have found an LCSW is a really key one to have. Social work students and trainees are uniquely uh, skilled, qualified, and um, uh, motivated to work in our programs. It really seems to train them well to work in the community-based settings like what we, what we offer in our programs. Clinical supervision takes on a lot of different um, models. We have certainly individual supervision. We have group supervision. Uh, sometimes we have treatment team meetings, and if a clinical supervisor is present during that treatment team meeting, we can count that as group supervision for students. Um, and then we have a, an expansion of triad, triadic supervision allowances with different licenses where um, you have a supervisor that's meeting with two students or trainees at the same time, and they get to split that supervision hour or whatever it is. And it offers a little bit more um, uh, dedicated time, supervision time, um, to each person that they wouldn't necessarily get in a larger group supervision setting. Uh, but it does also allow for the clinical supervisor to bring on more trainees um, to cover more student needs or, or training needs um, versus only offering individual supervision. Um, and then varying schools, licenses, state requirements, you have to know, you know, as you're working with all these different schools and you're working with all these different um, licensing bodies um, and state requirements, you have to really know all these different the rules that come into play, all the different regulations that are in place for each of the people you're working with, so that we make sure everybody's supervision and training experience is successful. How we utilize trainees. Uh, we utilize trainees with behavioral health assessments. Uh, we have them assisting with service planning. We have them doing individual and group interventions with our clients. We have them doing discharge planning. As I mentioned earlier, um, Discharge planning is such an important aspect of what our clients achieve and work on while they're at our programs. And our trainees get to learn so much about the resources in the community that they're, that they're gonna work on, work in. Um, so that they really kind of get to know what, what's, what's available for the people we serve. Uh, they certainly work in the milieu and do a crisis intervention and things like that. One thing that's changed in recent uh, months again is, you know, now they're doing, we're doing some telehealth at the programs, which we've never done or considered before as a result of COVID. And that's offered some different flexibility and different exposure. And I think, you know, telehealth sometimes is a little bit of the wave of the future in, in a lot of ways. So now students actually get some training on providing services via teleconferencing and, and Zoom and things like that. Um, so it's, I think it's a, it's a, a additive, nice value added to the programs, training program. Uh, training and orientation, um, we don't kind of just throw people a set of keys and, and go at it. So uh, what we do is uh, the orientation, we, we do an orientation checklist. And this is where you kind of learn all the nuts and bolts of working in the program. What's it like in a typical day, evening, overnight, not overnight, our students usually work overnights, but um, what's it like to work on a typical shift, all the things that come up, where everything is, um, how to do different tasks during the day and, and whatnot. And they learn a lot of that on the job and there's an orientation checklist and we go through and make sure everybody's learning all those different things the same way. Um, we train them on safety precautions, how to do belonging searches, how to assess for certain issues, how to, um, you know, make sure somebody's safe before leaving on pass, like all those types of precautions. Um, we talk about uh, our model. We have, you know, crisis residential, and we use this, what's called the START model. It's called short-term acute residential treatment. So we teach our students and our trainees about the START model and our vision for crisis residential services. And we teach them about PSR, psychosocial rehabilitation principles and the recovery model, which is key to crisis residential services in general. We've decided, we, we determined that it's best to have uh, some sort of an organized effort around our clinical interventions. And we've found that these three uh, core interventions that we implement help to kind of organize everybody's services. So we use CBT, we use DBT, and we use MI as core treatment and intervention models to work with our, our population. And we use those, uh, the language from those models in our documentation when we're speaking to clients, when we're speaking to each other, when we're doing service planning. So really important that they understand the core tenets of, the, of those um, interventions. 
how we do a lot of the stuff that we do is through shadowing or how we train a lot of the people we're training is through shadowing. So whether they're learning how to do a behavioral health assessment, individual and group supervision, I'm sorry, uh, individual and group interventions, um, they're doing that by uh, shadowing us first, shadowing a seasoned clinician first, doing those tasks. Um, and then when everybody feels comfortable, they switch and they do the, they do the uh, assessment or the, intervent, the individual or group intervention and we shadow them. And then when everybody feels safe and comfortable, the uh, clinical supervisor is consulted and they're just determined that this person's ready to work a little bit more independently, knowing that there is a team group environment that we all work in every day, every shift, and consultation is available no matter what they're doing. Um, so nobody's typically or you know, literally alone out there, um, but there is that opportunity to kind of learn and come back and train as, as needed or, or get some clarifications as needed. Um, milieu and crisis intervention, uh, de-escalation, verbal de-escalation, huge things to kind of learn when you're working in a training in a crisis residential program. So in conclusion, uh, we've found that our relationships with the universities and their students uh, to be one of the most enriching aspects of our programs and our treatment teams. It's really um, a mutual learning experience every year. We learn from our students and our trainees just as much as they learn from us. And it provides new behavioral health and social service professionals with exposure to and experience seeing the benefits of this important level of care, the crisis residential level of care. So it's really a great way to kind of get the word out a little bit about what we do and then the model that we, uh, want, we want to advocate for. Um, with that, I'd like to thank you for your interest in this topic. And we'll now move to questions or anyone who would like to share their experience working with trainees or students at the universities. Thank you. I think we're waiting for my co-presenter and the moderator to join us. Me? Oh. There, Rania. Yes, you can see me, right? <laughs> I could never tell if someone can hear and see me. Uh, we're waiting now for Carrie. I know we got some questions in the box. So I'm just gonna like scroll up and see if I can find my first one. Um, there's Carrie. Hi. So the first one was, um, from the first one was about, um, about how do you deal with residency issues with, this is for Rania, for your students, <laughs> because are they actually residents of the county where they're, um, colleges. So I know for the crisis residential that's in our local area, it's grant based and um, they never run into any insurance issues. So usually it's easily handled that way. Um, I don't know if like that question, if I answered it or if it needs to be <laughs> clarified. I think that I think that, I think that helps. Um, have you had any feedback from students about being in the same crisis residential facility as like non-students, wondering if, if it's a good fit to mix them up or if it's uh, if there's a preference for just a student focused um, facility? So we definitely. Um, so oddly enough, I used to supervise the crisis residential in the local town I'm in right now. And um, now I'm on the other side with the university. And so in working at that crisis res, I can tell you there was a good mix of people there. So we had students, we had uh, local residents, we had outside of the state people. And we did hear feedback. Um, majority of the students actually shared that it was nice to sort of exit the campus bubble for a second, because sometimes when you're within that campus bubble, a lot of the focus, and I know that student affairs right now, they're having a lot of conversations about uh, transitioning the conversation uh, to say that there are many ways for a, a student to succeed. That success is not just measured by a graduation rate, 
But a lot of times we hear from the students that whenever they go to seek help, a lot of times it's like, okay, so how do we get you functioning how you need to function in order for you to be set and on track for graduation? So then when they go to the crisis res and they're in group therapy with all walks of life, they really get to hear different perspectives and they get a little bit of a break from the school setting. Um, it really allows them to take um, a step back or out and um, be able to reevaluate some things and get a different perspective. Um, there is sort of like this culture shock that we do see with some students because uh, I think that they don't uh, realize that there is a community outside of the campus. So they believe that in Urbana-Champaign, it's just U of I. And then they step out and the crisis res is embedded within the community. And they're like, oh, there's a whole different community culture here and resources and services that are available outside of the university. That's great. I think that's, that's excellent um, because uh, students can feel so much pressure towards uh, getting good grades and, and they see life in a very narrow way. And so um, I think that's a wonderfully enlightening way to uh, deal with it. What arrangements can you do you make or does the college make so that students don't worry about getting kicked out of school for having a mental health problem or failing classes? I know um, this is uh, something that comes up frequently when we have college students. They feel like they don't have time for their mental health. Yes, it does come up frequently, and this is a great question to answer because I think it helps reduce the barrier of a student actually asking and taking the steps to get help. So every community college, every university has a either student affairs office or an office of the dean of students, and from 8 a.m. to 5, Monday through Friday, you can call that office. And then during after hours, there is an emergency, either dean or um, official from the school that takes calls. And so within our town, all the crisis teams, whether it be Rosecrans or the pavilion that are located in Urbana-Champaign, when they come into contact with a university or community college student, what we do is we either call the emergency dean and let them know, hey, we came into contact with the student, let us know if you need anything. Um, or we um, end up during like my presentation when I talked about a weekly relay of names or, hey, we came into contact with five students. If you need more information, let us know. We also work with the student to see if they're comfortable with this. So we don't ever want a student to say, how am I supposed to um, turn in my paper, or how will the school ever understand that I need to take five days off, two days off, two weeks. So what we do is we educate them that there are things that are set in place, such as professor notifications, and they're confidential. So the professor wouldn't know if it's a medical leave, a short medical leave, or if it was a funeral, or if it's a mental health issue, they have no idea. So it's HIPAA protected. So the deans at the school send out the professor notification and it's a very simple process. And we try to make it very simple for the student. After the professor notification, what we do is we issue an absent letter that actually goes out to anyone the student wants it to go out to, which lets the professor know to be accommodating. So if there was an exam that was missed, if there was a paper, if there was material that the student no longer will have access to or understand, the instructor or the professor is going to be accommodating and help that student catch up. So currently with COVID going on, we see that professors are holding special um, office hours over Zoom to accommodate any student that may have had an absent. So at our university, we do have um, students who are testing positive and they're quarantining or isolating, and that's requiring some of their, uh, some absences from class. So a lot of students are being grouped into these um, office hours where the professor will re-teach uh, the material or provide accommodations for the material missed. 
That's great. Uh, that's so um, that's so helpful. Uh, and I really love how uh, there's the stigma of mental health is um, is really not the professor's business. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so that's really great. Now for Dan, we've got some questions. Are there any big lessons learned from like uh, poor internship administration with local universities? Um, Travis brought this one up. Um, or, or students that shows certain traits that uh, don't work out. I know I had an intern that uh, wasn't reliable. And that was an interesting conversation with uh, the professor. Uh, yeah, we, we've had a couple of different situations happen that have led us to really kind of centralize our administration of the internship um, group. Uh, so when you have so many students at so many different programs with so many different program directors and individual clinical supervisors, um, it really helps to have a centralized process to manage the contracts, to approve schools for internship uh, so that things don't get so get scattered and, and um, problems develop quickly that way. Um, our, our big thing that, that came up is when we were having behavioral issues or, or disciplinary issues with students, managing, managing those in a way that was, um, uh, we wanted to protect our relationship with the university. So we want to make sure that we're you know, consulting with them and whatnot. So there is, again, that one centralized person. For us, it's one of our senior vice presidents and it's our senior vice president of clinical operations that um, really oversees the entire thing. So anytime a director or a clinical supervisor is having something, some issue, we bring it to that person um, to kind of consult, put a plan together. How are we going to handle this? We want to protect all the different relationships and make sure that we're managing the student in a compassionate way. Um, and then we, we have had also situations where I think I, there was one several years ago where um, we did actually exercise our ability to terminate the agreement with the school just because we were having challenges with the administration at the school um, meeting their obligations and whatnot. So it does, again, help in that sense to have one person monitoring all that stuff so that you're catching those things and watching for those things as they come up. Um, as far as students, um, you know, it's an intensive environment that we work in. So um, if we detect that someone um, is maybe a little bit more fragile themselves, uh, we might kind of screen them out or direct them to one of our other programs where the intensity level is a little less severe or significant or, or outstanding. Um, so we, we do watch, we, we do you know, monitor or interview and, and screen for um, certain dynamics that we think are going to work well with our program. Um, we look for people who can work well with a team. We look for people who can manage stress and anxiety, knowing that they're, you know, new clinicians and, and green and there's going to be challenges and there's going to be that anxiety. We also look for when we have a new clinician and they seem to be fully confident with no anxiety, that's a child, that's potentially a problem because now we got maybe a loose cannon coming into the program. So we watch for all those kinds of things. Um, and we have a really good uh, good stretch. We have very few uh, incidents where we have a problem with somebody that that rises to the level of bringing it to the school or terminating an internship, which you have to you know, unfortunately do as well. Um, so yeah, that, that's, I think I answered both those questions. <laughs> And that's like the idea of like the student being able to try out a setting for post-graduation. And so not only are we monitoring um, when I used to supervise interns, but rather the student is really trying out the setting and figuring out, is this a good fit before they go into full practice? So I think that's like one of the best um, parts of having those crisis based experiences before actually signing up for full blown full time crisis. Yeah, absolutely. Another another question we had um, was, what about bachelor's level internships for like social workers? Um, uh, these folks are greener um, and maybe less prepared than master's level or higher. Have you folks done the bachelor's level? So we have people, are you talking about people who are um, bachelors uh, pursuing their MSW? No. Um, I think Jamie was asking this. I think she was asking about um, people who are, yeah, really still getting their bachelor's degree. 
Oh, uh, we don't have bad. We have one program. I believe it's a, a, a rehab counseling program that's local at one of our at, uh, SDSU, San Diego State University. Um, and those are lower level students um, who are pursuing a bachelor's degree. Um, to be honest, sometimes we find students at the lower level to be even better. I mean, sometimes it's just, you know, we have good luck with every, with, with some of those students. Um, some of the best students are those. Um, and again, when you're screening people correctly and, and sure that you're bringing the, the best people in or the proper people for your environment, you know, sometimes the best ones because you can really kind of mold them into, you know, what you want and, and uh, they haven't been prior exposed to other settings sometimes. So it could be a really rewarding experience and they appreciate the ability to be brought on and, and have that exposure. I think that's great. The, um, the second what Dan said, um, some of our great interns were actually bachelor right before they got their bachelor. So within their uh, bachelor studies and they were just so eager. So what we did is we teamed them up with a clinician so that um, they're not entering anything on their own and they're not practicing on their own. Um, and I will say that we've gone on to hire them post bachelors and as they complete their master's program. So we've had some really great luck with uh, our bachelor levels. That's excellent. Um, if folks have more questions for Dan, uh, or Rania, um, feel free to enter them into the, the Q&A. But I feel like our time is about up. Yeah. So um, I think we need to move on to our next uh, presentation. Yeah, people can just private message us or Slack channel. Yeah, this is great. Bye, everyone.